Hey, I'm Jennifer Hervitz, best-selling author of the books One Happy Divorce and Woulda, Coulda, Shoulda. I'm a relationship coach, a public speaker, and I'm the mom of two of the most kick-ass teenage boys around. Raw, authentic, and insightful, this podcast is a no-bullshit slice of reality for anyone curious about what it looks like to get divorced. On Doing Divorce Right, we'll give you the tools you'll need to navigate your relationships, whether you're contemplating divorce or have already signed the papers. We'll figure it out together without taking ourselves too seriously here on Doing Divorce Right Podcast. Hi, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to Doing Divorce Right. I'm Jennifer Hurwitz, and I'm your host per usual. I'm happy to be here, and I'm going to take a deep breath and slow down this morning because... Um, this episode is, is going to be hard for me to get through, I'm going to be honest, but I am so honored and blessed to have my guest here today. I'm going to do audio and video. So if you're listening, thank you for joining. If you're watching today on YouTube or wherever this is playing, hi, everybody. Um, you get to see my face and the beautiful Ginger Gentile who's here with me today is the producer and director of the feature documentary, Erasing Family. I'm already tearing up, um, which exposes the trauma that children suffer when a loving parent is erased by the divorce courts. Oh my gosh, you guys, this is going to be an episode worth listening to, please. And um, turn it up and listen carefully because this is a problem that affects over 22 million families in the U.S. alone. This is Ginger's third feature film, which I did not know until I read this, previously Erasing Dad, which premiered in Argentina in 2014. Right, Ginger? Right. Okay. And that made the issue of family bond obstruction front page news and caused legislation permitting joint custody to be enacted. She is also the deputy executive director of the National Parents Association organization, which works to promote shared parenting and family court reform. Correct? Correct. Welcome, Ginger. Welcome, welcome. How are you, honey? I'm doing very well, Jennifer. Thanks for having me on. I'm very excited to be here. Okay, okay, so Ginger, I'm not going to interrupt you. I'm okay. going to ask you, you're going to start flat out. And how did this start? How did you come into this? And where did you get this idea to do this documentary film? Sure. So I'm sure like a lot of people find themselves in this space. I never set out to say I'm going to work in divorce and family, especially because I never had a very good relationship with my family. I never held my family or, or spending time with them as something important. Okay. And looking back, that is because I'm a child of divorce, of high conflict divorce. My parents got divorced when I was 13. And something that we don't talk about, we often talk about a child who goes towards one parent and rejects the other half. We also, we also don't talk about the children who decide I reject everybody because this family is such a mess. And that was where I was at. Okay. And that's why I moved to Argentina right after I graduated university in 2001. And no, I don't have any connection to Argentina. No, I didn't speak Spanish. No, I don't have family there. Wow. Um, you're, just, you're just like, I'm going. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was going to be a six month, uh, trip to learn some Spanish. And I stayed there for 13 years. That's amazing, Ginger. Wow. Okay. And I, I got involved in the film industry there. And about six years in, um, I met a man, we were on a date, which I didn't realize we're on a date. And he <laughs> says, I'm very stressed because I haven't seen my daughter in six years. Oh my God. Really? Six yeah. years? Six years. Oh my gosh. At that point. And I, like most people respond with, well, you must have a very bad lawyer. Uh, I come from a family of lawyers. And at the time I was doing, in addition to my film work to pay the bills, I was doing legal translation. So I'm like, let's go down to the courthouse. I'm sure we'll all get this all settled. Right. I'll see what's going on. I'll see it with fresh, unemotional eyes. Okay. And then I see that he has all these orders to see his daughter. He became the producer of my first film, A Racing Dad. And talking to him, and to be clear, his story is not in the film. His story was very dramatic. He was in jail for a year and three months because he had custody of his daughter, but a criminal court judge put him in jail for kidnapping. Oh my God, this is and of course, And of course, he was cleared of all charges, but that was a year and three months that he ate in a South American prison. Um, you know, so, and, and the reason why he was awarded custody and, and because the film starts off with when we did the film, custody always went to the mother by law. Okay, this is and, our, right, right. in Argentina until the sure. age of seven. So he was able to get custody uh, because the mother was declared unfit, which is very hard to do. But the very mother hard. was able to go to a family court judge and say, look, he's kidnapping. And then the law says, well, a parent can't kidnap their own child and, and all this crazy stuff. But basically what happened is when I started to talk to people who he was talking to, because he met them at the court or lawyers, there was so much shame around this issue. Nobody wanted to talk about this because if you talked about this, automatically people would say, well, you must have done something wrong. Right. They would blanketly call these fathers 
pedophiles, even though there was no there was no um, evidence. accusation. Accusation. No, not evidence. Right. No, 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 no. No one ever accused them. Oh, but people no. People say so. So, but they would just say, "Well, obviously, you can't see your kid because you raped them." Right. right. Must be. Right. Must be. So there, <sighs> there wasn't even that there was a false accusation, or and, and then what I was beginning to see was a lot of what I call. Um, true but crazy accusations. So for example, I met a young father, actually a Russian who went to Swarthmore in the US and he's a film racing dad. And he was accused of giving his child dark chocolate instead of milk chocolate, not allowing the child to watch TV and talking to the child in Russian so the child would be bilingual. And he says, all of that is true. But because of that, I was declared unfit to see my child because this is just considered uh, gender-based violence. Oh, my gosh. Because everything was being considered, considered to be violence. And these are just different parenting choices. And one could say not letting your child watch TV, giving them less sugary chocolate. and I'd be in big so, trouble, Ginger. You know, um, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, so it's just finding a lot of stuff like that. Because I think we, we tend to think that there's all these false accusations. But the way the court system works in Argentina around the world is you don't need false accusations you just need to buy time okay. and create accusations that might be true, but in any other context would be considered a normal parenting choice, such as raising a bilingual child, sure. um, clothing choices, haircuts, uh, you know, just all these normal pa parenting choices. Yeah. But the, a system that was designed to protect people in very vulnerable situations of domestic violence, extreme psychological abuse, is now being employed by lawyers who are unscrupulous, who want money, by people who just want the other parent out of their life or to get a child support payment to use this system to create these divorces that should be peacefully resolved into highly contentious cases that go on for years or decades. I've talked to families who've been in family court since the child was born and now the child's 18. And their only hope is that, you know, eventually the child will age out, which is a double-edged sword because you don't have to go to court anymore. You stop losing all this money. But also the courts say, well, we can't do anything about you and your, your relationship with your kid because the kid has aged out. Okay. But just to go back to Argentina very, very quickly to wrap this story up with a bow. Okay. Okay. So we present the movie and if people want to watch it, they can go to racingfamily.org and it's yes. available for free on our website. And yes, I've been talking about that all day, actually. Now, <laughs> it's in Spanish with English subtitles. Why is it available for free? It's because it was the first movie censored in democracy in Argentina. Um, there was a Supreme Court order that it could not be on YouTube or any other streaming platform. It was taken down YouTube about five times. And the reason why is that the professionals that we interviewed in the film this is very important because people always say, oh, was it some parent who was mad at what the other parent was saying? No, no, no parent even one just sent me an email saying, you know, uh, you know, I'm happy the dad's not seeing the kid. We're happy, happy, happy. Um, but other than that, people realize that if you start saying, well, what they're saying is not true, then you have to prove what they're saying is not true. So they actually don't want anything to do with us. And but the professionals were on camera saying, I always assume that the father is guilty. I never want to interview him. And the most dangerous place for a child is their own home because of the presence of the father. Because what are all men but rapists in potential? Right. Just waiting to rape. Sure. Yeah. Now, what they didn't realize is that when any normal person hears this, and I, I say normal is 98% of society, they're like, WTF, what right. are you talking about? Right, exactly right. This is yeah. crazy. Right. I had a good relationship with my father. What of do you course. mean? My, I, I should remove the child from my, my, my home with my husband? And they would say yes, because you don't know really what, you know, this crazy kind of witch hunt scenario. Right. And um, so that's why they, they got the film censored. They had friends in high places. One of the women who we interviewed, her husband was a Supreme Court judge. Gotcha, okay. So okay. that is why they were able to censor the film. Now, the good news is everybody wants to see a censored film. The media doesn't like when you censor films because journalists don't like censorship. And then people are like, well, why are people so scared of this very low budget, small film? Why are they saying that it should not be seen by anyone? It's so dangerous. And people watch this film, they say, wait a minute, this film is not anti-woman. It's not anti-mom. It's talking about why are fathers always assumed to be unfit? This is unfair towards fathers. And my previous film, which threw people for a loop, was about the fight of young women to play soccer, football, which is considered a male sport in Argentina. And so I'm like, look, I'm, I'm against gender discrimination for anybody. 
Yeah. And, you know, you shouldn't assume that a woman should automatically make a good caring mother. A man is not capable of taking care of his children, just like we shouldn't assume that women shouldn't play sports or be part of the government. This is all part of the same, uh, uh, you know, in binary gender ideology right. that people are people are beginning to say this is unhealthy because instead of looking at ourselves as individuals we are forcing people into these molds and um the result of the racing dad was that uh argentina enacted joint custody reform so joint custody is now a possibility in argentina before it wasn't right. even a possibility right and also uh that uh, it removed the gender bias from the law so custody no longer automatically goes to the mother so but cr- the best part is from the film, families begin to reunite because kids began to see the film and reach out to their parents, and judges started to decide differently. And see my, face. 2000- you, my oh, listeners yeah. can't see my face. I'm like, I'm like, my mouth is to the floor. I mean, my people that can see, if you're watching this, but people, listeners, I am just. You're amazing. You're just an amazing Thank human. You. Okay, so go for, keep going. I'm not interrupting you again. So, so then in 2015, okay. I go back to the United States. Okay, I want to make a follow-up film, and the first thing I notice. Um, well, the first thing I do is I just put up a Facebook post okay. and I get inundated, and this is in the film, of just people reaching out, desperate to tell their stories, desperate for help because there's no help for these parents. Yeah. And the first thing I notice is that about half the people contacting me are moms who lost custody. Oh. So I'm beginning to see that, at least in the United States, this isn't a mom's or dad's issue. Mm -hmm. Statistically, dads are more likely to lose custody, but the number of mothers is growing exponentially. And for me, that's because the business of family court is non-ideological. It's a money-making machine, and they use the ideology in the way that that it can make them money, which is to prolong these court cases and create high-conflict situations instead of resolving them. But then the other thing I saw was because in Erasing Dad and some people said, well, you didn't really interview the kids. We just have a few short clips of kids that, you know, we'd get smuggled from cell phones. I'm like, well, if their dad can't talk to them, how am I going to talk to them? And then by between 2011, when I started making Erasing Dad and 2015, social media exploded. And now kids as young as seven are making videos. I began to see kids saying, I can't see my my brother, I can't see my dad, or talking to the family court judge, being like, I don't understand why I can't see my dad. Uh, This is the result of the trauma that you inflicted on me, talking to the judges directly. Oh my gosh. Desperate. And so then I was like, okay. I got it. I I can find these kids because, and it was very hard. It took me two years to find kids willing to tell their stories. Wow. But I could find them because they're speaking out. And I feel Mm -hmm. that the people who will solve this issue are the children who have gone through this because we as children don't have this emotional desperation to reunite with our kids because we are grown up. Mm. Because when the parents are going through this, when they are an erased parent who can't see their kid, uh, sometimes they can become advocates and activists. They can help other people, but they are not suffering from PTSD. They're suffering from ongoing trauma. The trauma is not resolved, and that creates desperation. It can create um, anger. It can create... um, behaviors that we would call craziness because they say no one will listen to me i would be nuts you know every you know yes i mean and imagine that it's you know people say i can't imagine weeks well some of these parents it's been five ten years of i don't know what i would do as a mom of two teenage i mean thank god see this is all very i love listening Mm -hmm. having her i'm a thank god i'm blessed enough to have a happy divorce right but like i would i don't know what i would do i thinking about it makes me cry i'm like about to cry if i couldn't see my kids I can't even imagine. That's why wow. listening to you is just, I mean, what you're doing is, right. right. Keep going. I'm sorry. So, so, I, so I've, been to, I've been connecting with, with more adult children. Mm-hmm. Um, one is Ash Nicole Russell, who <laughs> does collaborative law out of North Carolina. Um, Dr. Tori, uh, and, uh, who also does a lot of stuff with fatherlessness and daddy issues, as she calls it. And... You know, there's also some other great women out there like Emma Johnson and, um, uh, oh God, Nadja, Nadja Hall, who, yeah. who runs Black and Blended. And all these women, um, Emma is a mom, um, but we are, you know, able to see this issue from a different perspective and kind of saying this system is crazy and the way that most divorces end, we see as normal, it's not normal. Mm-mm. And, you know, one thing that Ashley Nicole Russell taught me as and she does collaborative law, which seeks to create, which seeks a win-win solution. Yes, it does. Is that 
one, you don't have to go to court. You don't. You don't. Number two, uh, the first thing a lawyer says is stop talking to your soon-to-be ex-spouse. She's like, but you've talked to them for years. Yes. You don't have to escalate through a lawyer. <laughs> yes. And then the system has to be designed. I mean, I'm not even going to give you a crazy example from a friend of mine. Please. Um, getting divorced, he has no kids, and it's, they agree on everything. He still has to travel to another state and stand before a judge just for them to stamp the divorce. I can't. And you're like, and like, he's going to have to take time off work. He's going to have to drive, you know, from California to Texas to stand before a judge. You don't really know what the judge is going to say. I'm with you. Um, and, and we need to create a system. And what we show in the film, for example, A Racing Family is in Sweden. Uh, you can decide child custody with a letter that you mail in and it costs a, price, costs a postage stamp because the assumption is that parents should think about what is best for the child and not go to court. That's the um, whole thing. That's my you, can still, you can still erase a parent in Sweden. You can still have very bad outcomes in Sweden, but they're much less and 60% of parents share custody equally. It's only 9% in Canada. And in the US, we don't have statistics, but I'm sure it's in line with Canada. And that's in part because there's nothing to gain. There's no money to gain. There's no advantage uh, by having... Right. You know, by going to court. Right. And so we need to redesign the system. We need to I engineer agree. the system so that court is rare if it exists at all. And we need to identify families that need help and put them on a path to healing, yes. which, which is not always therapy, um, especially with people who have personality disorders. We've, we're finding that therapy doesn't work. It doesn't mean that's untreatable because people often say, oh, I can't co-parent with my ex as a narcissist. You can, it's difficult. Can, what they need is, is, yes. is coaching with very clear guidelines. <laughs> That's what I do. Exactly. I you totally know, agree with you. I love you, you know, Ginger. Yes, so, yes, so, yes. But we need to start talking to people about this because what I'm also afraid of is that the term parental alienation or being erased is going to be used as just another excuse to keep the other parent out saying they're alienating me. So therefore custody should be completely reversed with no contact. Whereas the people who are serious about this say sometimes we have to do temporary, um, you know, no contacts, but they should be very temporary. And they should be weeks, and then and then there should be okay. You can there's contact reestablished if these guidelines are met, and you know, and unfortunately, some parents will choose not to follow the guidelines or go to therapy. But there should always be a, a clear way towards reunification okay, towards a healthy a family. Yeah. I have a question for Ginger. Do you see? And this is just mind blowing to me. But do you see this happening with people who are not in like I? Like just erasing family with people who are not in like high, like I'm not making sense, but like if they're not even in, there's no drugs involved, there's no abuse involved, there's no, and they're still doing this? Yes. I mean, I mean, we always talk about, so if there's drugs or abuse, you have an unfit parent and that's right. not a race. Uh, that's that's not what a I'm talking race. about. Like, so this is different than that because I've never. No, 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 no. This is, this is, this is very different because we're talking about fit loving parents. Oh my God. How does um, this happen? How does so, this happen? So what we're talking about, so first of all, if a parent abuses a child, is that's violent unfit. or neglectful, yes, of course. That's, that's unfit. Exactly. Hopefully that parent will, can be rehabilitated. I don't yes. think anybody is evil okay, or right. can ever be rehabilitated. But okay? we're but talking about like, people who are clearly just like for no reason not getting custody. I mean, like this is craziness. Right. So, so talking to people. Like, let's make what, that clear here, everybody, right? Right. right. This is, this is, these are fit parents. Oh my gosh. It's um, Often they don't present well because they're heartbroken because they can't see their children. They're very oh, emotional. Right. But these are parents who pass psych evaluations with flying colors. They pass drug tests with flying colors. Uh, and so normally what the accusation is, yeah. is the child doesn't want to see you. Oh my God, that is so cool. And, so and then the courts, and then the, right. And then the courts never say, well, why is that? Or it's been five years, so of course the child doesn't have a relationship. How we this oh my God. back on track? So in a lot of states, I know in California, a child as young as 12 or 13 can testify who they want to live with, <laughs> and the court will often take that testimony at face value. So one thing we talk about in the film is how unreliable children's testimony can be. Right. And while a lot of courts are moving to not asking for this, we still see cases where children are testifying in open court or in chambers, Right. The judges will often admit that they, they have no uh, training on how to interview children. Oh. So that's what they'll do is they'll pass this off to a custody evaluator who makes a ton of money. 
And the custody evaluator will then, without having to present scientific evidence as to why, will decide parent A is slightly better, so they should get more custody. And one thing that anyone who's serious says is that you're either fit or you're not. So either you can get joint custody or you should be supervised. But saying, I think that the child should be with parent A 65% of the time and parent B 35 which is what they do, it's a racket and a scam. Because, and, and I, I'm talking to a mom in New York uh, who is a lesbian mother. This is important to the story. Okay. So she is suing for standing because she was never able to adopt the child. Okay. So this should be a clear-cut legal case of does she have standing to actually even request custody or okay. visitation? Right. And then they, so then she said I, she got a forensics uh, custody evaluator to see if she could at least get visits in the meantime. This custody evaluator has been interviewing everybody who she ever met. It's been about 50 hours in. Each hour is $500. She said, I lost one house in California. I'm going to lose my brownstone in New York. I can't pay for this. And she said, but no one, at, at no point did she, do they ask, what is my relationship like with my son? Am I a good mother? All of it is, what was the breakup like with your ex? What is your relationship like with your ex-partners? What is your job situation like? And she's like, no one's ever asking or even doing like, um, you know, an interview with them together to see how they interact. Nothing. And this is the huge scam and problem. And you know, I know there's custody evaluator, evaluators out there who probably do good work or who stand by the work that they do, but this insistence is an insistence on bankrupting people. So one thing we show in the film is that if a court insists on this, the court should pay for it. Oh, that's a great idea. If the court insists on any program, the court should pay for it because even parents who say, oh, I got supervised visits, but the supervised visit is $250 an hour, so there's no way I can afford to see my kids. Or I need to go to a parenting class, and if you're very low income, because that's the thing that I think we forget if we come from a middle class background. Sure. Um, in, in New York City, for example, every time you have to file something, it's $125 in family court. This is just um, <laughs> if you're making a minimum, minimum wage in New York City, I think is $15 an hour. Right, yeah. How can you pay so, for that? How can anyone in that? I mean, how? Or even if it's, if it's like supervised visits are two hundred dollars an hour, how can you pay for that if you're making fifteen an hour? You don't. No. And so then these, so then the other parent can say, "You see, they don't love you. They're not willing to pay for these supervised visits." Oh my God, Ginger, this is awful. And then I'm, and then also, you, there, there's long term effects to these kids. I mean, I've read about this on your website. There are long term right. effects that these these kids are going to have. So some of the long-term effects of, that kids have, from, and we talk about this in the documentary, yeah. Erasing Family, which if people want more information, they can go to erasingfamily.org. Yes, we're going to have it all in the show notes. Everything. Is, is, so first of all, children grow up believing a lie that they're not loved or a parent isn't fit when they actually are loved and the parent wants to see them. So I always say, imagine that you're a kid and you're told that a parent doesn't love you, can't see you, is unfit. That right there is horrible and, and, and tragic. But now imagine that when you're 18, 28, I've talked to people who realize this when they're 60, you realize it was all a lie. Oh, I'm going to cry, Ginger. I can't even. And you realize that, that, that not just that parent, but that, that identity. So mm-hmm. often kids haven't seen siblings in 20 years. They haven't seen grandparents, grandparents yeah. cousins, uncles. Uh, some children talk about not having contact with their cultural heritage. So we interview one young woman whose uh, father was Iranian or is Iranian. Mm-hmm. And she talked about her mother hated Iranian culture and how it was so hard for her to grow up in a society that viewed her as a person of color, as Iranian, being told that her cultural heritage was evil. Uh, we also have what I found with a lot of children is they often cut themselves. Um, women, uh, young women, often they look for love in all the wrong places. Of course, of course. Young men can often act out and that there, there are often cries for help and desperation. And in some cases, we see students who are highly functional, um, who do well in school, who are able to get jobs, who go off to college, um, but their inner life is a wreck. Yeah. Um, they often emotionally shut down. And I remember some people when they watch a racing family will say some of the kids seem a little robotic. And I'm like, well, if you listen to their emotion. story, yeah. they say I had to build a wall and sure. cut off any emotion because if they really acknowledge what's going on, they can't it's too painful. So it's the high functioning ones. Um, but then they will say, 
relationships and kids, no thanks. I don't want to get involved. <laughs> of course not. Why would they? Right. But they're saying, you know, um, one girl said, I don't want to get involved in a relationship. And she's 20. So she's not talking about having kids or getting married. She's talking about dating. She's like, why would I do that if someone's just going to end up hurting you? Oh my God, this is horrible. So Ginger, what do, we, what do we do, my listeners? What can we do to help? Where do we find? So racingfamily.org. Right. And so we can donate. there's a few things we can, we can Please tell more us. Than, more than donate is right now more. the film is finished. Okay. So we need people to set up screenings. Okay. And we need people to set up screenings. And where people, the first thing they say is, I'm going to sit up in my divorce and separate group, support mm-hmm. group. That's great. But people know about that. And a lot of parents find the film very difficult. We need this it's set up in u- universities. Okay. Oh. Because we kill two birds with one stone. One, that's where the erased children are. And they're out of the home for the first time. Okay. So the film will cause reunification. So we want to bring the film to universities. Okay. And there's two reasons to do this. First of all, this is where erased children are outside of their, for, of their home for the first time and the film is designed to cause non-judicial reunification so what that means is that everything in the film i thought if i was a young adult 25 and we've tested this would this piece of information whether it's an interview with an erased family who reunited and we show how the reunification works or about how the family court system works or how the laws work will this allow me to heal to not blame my parents and to start talking to them Gotcha. So we need to get this film to universities. And there's a scene in the film where we ask, how many of you have experienced parental alienation? 45% of the kids' hands go up. Oh, my God. Really? That is so shocking to me. That is so shocking. Do you know that until I read your, came across your website, mm-hmm. I'd never heard of it? And I'm divorced. Wow. And I have, wow. I mean, but that goes to yeah. show you where I live. I mean, I mean and those 45% of the kids, I mean, the question was had experienced it. So some, they experienced some of the behaviors, but it oh. wasn't actually oh. resulted in, in being alienated or I maybe see. it was a I sibling. See. So that's why it's high. Okay. But, you know, it's it's much higher than we think, yes. depending on how we define it. And also that's where the professionals of tomorrow are. So if you speak yes. at universities, okay. law schools, psych departments, schools of social work, okay. these kids will know about this and be able to that's so defend smart. it. So smart. Then the okay. other place we want to take it to are bar associations, judges, family courts. Yep. And politicians. So we've already had some screenings set up with state legislative reps. We're working on one in the U.S. Capitol. And that's where we want to take it. And the idea of a film, and this is what's beautiful about it, is that if you tell your friends, Mm -hmm. let's say you're going through this, I want you to read a book or go to a lecture about parental alienation, family court, they're going to, eh. But if you say, hey, I just want you to watch a movie, you're not asking people to sign anything, to agree with anything. It's just to come and and go on an emotional journey. I agree. And so it's, it's designed to be very easy. So that's the biggest help that we want people to do gotcha. okay, really. is, is set up a screening and you can rent a room. You don't have to rent a movie theater. Houses of worship often have great AV equipment. So oh, the churches. Got, gotcha. I actually told, uh, my, I told my rabbi about you. I okay. Right. And we're, do, we're doing uh, quite a few screenings in synagogues. We have that's one in, gotcha. in Phoenix. We have one in, in um, Boca Raton area coming up. Great. We have some in some Presbyterian churches. So, so, What's good about them is often they're free or low cost. They have the, the equipment. They're not being used if it's not a Saturday or a Sunday. Yeah, that's true too. Right? That's great. Universities. So where people are, and this is more effective than the most pretty movie theater you can find. Yeah, it doesn't matter. That we've had success in movie theaters. And also so people can know you can sell tickets. And we've had um, groups make $2,000 off of a screen. Oh, y'all, do you hear which, that? So, okay. Which they reinvested in more screenings, but people can use this as a moneymaker for their group. They can oh, donate they can it back it to, to you, us. They give it to you. Um, yeah. But I want people to show it. So if someone says, I need to make some money off of this, we're not against it. We want okay. the film to get out there. Okay. So and also, and this is important. If you bring it to a place where a hundred young people, and we're defining young people under the age of 26, show up and just taking a photo and having them sign something, we'll refund the screening fee, which is only $250. Oh my gosh. Did everybody hear so that's, that? That's a lecture hall in a university. It's not a lot. Okay. So that's the incentive. Okay. And, um, and also we, we also got a ton of great feedback from high school guidance counselors. I think oh. the film is very appropriate for high school students. Okay. And I think making part of the curriculum is a big ask, but renting a room in a high school and saying school teachers who want to come PTA parents and teachers we're having an event and what people can do in their schools is we also have some materials that are presented to schools but the big thing is one 
And this benefits all children, teaching children critical thinking skills. So if they're okay. told something about another parent, that they're able to see information and investigate. And this goes for stuff on the media from politicians. So critical thinking skills are great. We need to turn health class or sex ed into relationship building class. I agree. Yes, 100%. Teaching kids how to mm -hmm. identify red flags, how to lay out boundaries in a polite way, how to relieve stress and trauma through breathing exercises, I, totally. through self-care. Yep. And this will benefit everybody. Agree. And then also one thing schools can specifically do for situations like this is realize that, if a, that parents have a right to parent-teacher conferences and school information unless there's a court order. And one parent marching in saying, don't contact the other parent, that's not a court order, which is very common. Some schools offer this. If they see that you're divorced, they'll say, do you want the other parent to get oh, the report card? Oh, no, 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 no. And, and then also, finally, what for schools can do is if there's a school event, like a graduation sporting event, just say, hey, we know there's a lot of parents who are going through messy separations. Doesn't happen. Parents are always welcome. Yeah, that would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> we will seat you separately if needed, and we'll take two separate photos, but no child should be asked to choose Oh. which parent goes to an event, and no child should be removed from an event if the other parent shows up. Right. I wish that would, that would be And schools wonderful. can just start identifying this and creating self spaces, letting the other parents, maybe the non-custodial parents, come in to volunteer, um, come in to have lunch with their kids. Unfortunately, some parents are so full oh God, of yeah. revenge, they yes. will remove the child from the school permanently. Oh, my gosh. I work at that. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. Um, awesome. So, so that, those are some of the specific things. Thank you. And, you. and, we, and if people want to help help and volunteer. We are specifically looking for people who are in the PR field. So we get more press. We were just on ABC 15. And um, I know I saw that's amazing. And, mm -hmm. and we've been getting some good press, but I think with a press person, we'd get more. And we're also looking for people who can just really set up screenings and do outreach because Great. if the film, we do want the film to go on a streaming platform, I'm working on it, but the, the community screenings, they are organizing tools because then if they, you can promote services to help families families can get together to start talking about legislative reform or forming support groups. So can young people. They can come together and know that they're right. not alone. So this is why a community screening of a racing family is so important. Awesome. Ginger, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank I you. I loved having you. I loved having you. I appreciate this. Yeah. You so much. And uh, this is just a great message. And everybody, um, everything's going to be in the show notes. So we'll find you. And everybody knows it's erasingfamily.org. Yes. Correct. Awesome. Ginger, um, have a best, have a great day, honey. Thank you for being no, here. No, thank you, Jennifer. I'm thank you. Thank forward you, to thank sharing you. this with all of our more than 25,000 plus followers. Yay, and I've got more too, so it's going to be great. We're yeah. going to get this out to everybody. Awesome. And everybody, thank you for being here today. Uh, this you. is Doing Divorce Right. You know where to find me. Everywhere, everywhere, jenniferherbits.com. And um, as usual, peace, love, and lots of truth, y'all. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to Doing Divorce Right. If you enjoy the podcast, Please subscribe, recommend, rate, and review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Want to keep the podcast going? Support us by going to www.jenniferherbis.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Peace, love, and truth.